I've taught higher education for, for about 25 years. In addition, I've helped people that are in massage therapy school pass their massage therapy licensure exam. I've also been involved in helping people pass personal trainer certification exams and for strength and conditioning folks that uh, might want to pass the NSCA certified strength and conditioning specialist. During this time when I've been teaching, I've noticed that a lot of people have problems with kinesiology or the study of human movement. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And here, of course, I have my skeleton to help me. Stu kinesiology is a study of human movement, and it's a relation to the joints of our body that are more movable joints. We would call those joints probably synovial joints from a structural perspective, and diarthroses from more a functional perspective. Let's talk first about some of the common synovial joints, or those joints that move freely in the human body, and which might be the subject of kinesiology or the study of our human movement. First of all, let's look at the ball and socket joints. We have the shoulder joint, okay, or two shoulder joints, obviously, and we have two hip joints. These are referred to structurally as synovial joints, or specifically ball and socket joints, because they have a ball, usually, in this case, the head of humerus, that fits into a shallow fossa, or shallow socket. We have the hip down here, the hip joint, okay, head of the femur, fits into what we refer to as the acetabulum of the hip. This, again, rather deep socket that holds this rather large head comparatively to the shoulder joint is going to give integrity to that joint or make it difficult for this joint, the hip, to dislocate or come apart compared to the shoulder joint. So these are the two ball and socket joint examples in our body. Ball and socket, again, is a type of synovial joint. A synovial joint, okay, and these ball and sockets reflect freely movable joints. Now. When we look at other joints, okay, besides ball and socket joints, we look at hinge joints, very common joints that people are most often interested in the body. Examples of hinge joints would be elbow, down here the knee, the ankle is actually a hinge joint, and we have these little joints, okay, in our fingers called interphalangeal joints. Now, these joints, of course, are only capable of doing what movement, like we say, flexion, and extension. So what we know is that hinge joints are limited, okay, from the standpoint of their range of motion or degrees of movement compared to the ball and socket joints. But still, these hinge joints, just like the ball and socket joints, are examples of synovial joints or freely movable diarthrotic joints in the body. Well, those are the two major types as far as the synovial joints, but there are several others that are synovial in nature. We have in this case, okay, the pivot joint known as the radial ulnar joint. And we know that we have capabilities of this radius, all right, this bone that's on the lateral aspect of our forearm, and the ulna to rotate one over the other, or basically to pivot. Um, we have a common, okay, movement known at the uh, radial ulnar joint as pronation, where basically it ends up that our radius uh, rotates over our ulna and causes our palm to lay flat basically on the top of a desk or facing the floor here. We have the opposite movement at this pivot joint known as supination. And so we can raise our hands up to the ceiling, our palms face up, as if we were carrying a cup of soup. So this radial ulnar joint would be an example of a pivot joint. We have another pivot joint, okay, that allows us to see out of the rear view mirror, okay, if we have a blind spot as an example. We're looking, we look at the rear view mirror of our car as we're noticing whether or not we can move into a different lane. Okay, perhaps we were like a little concerned that maybe there's something in that blind spot we're not able to see. And so we would pivot on what we refer to, or what I would refer to, as many people would refer to, as the atlantoaxial joint. The atlas being the first cervical vertebra up here, and the axis being the second. In between, okay, where those two bone, bones come together, we have this example of a pivot joint, known as the atlantoaxial joint. Now, that's a pivot joint. I always remember the AA joint, atlantoaxial joint, being capable of rotating. And as all pivot joints are capable of doing, okay, this one is able to rotate. So we rotate our head to look into that blind spot. I oftentimes think, how can I remember that atlantoaxial joint as far as what its actions are? And I think of from this perspective, hey, I could think of, ah, atlantoaxial joints like AA, like going to an AA meeting where you just say no, shake your head no to alcohol. So that might be a way to remember this pivot joint, specifically the atlantoaxial joint. Well, besides ball and socket joints, hinge joints, pivot joints, we also have condyloid joints, condyloid. 
Condyloid joints, okay, as an example of a synovial joint would be, I'm going to give you the wrist joint. The wrist joint is sometimes referred to as the radiocarpal joint. Because it's the radius, this bone on the thumb side of the hand come together with a couple of these carpal bones, or these wrist bones, we would say, one of which is the scaphoid, another the lunate, and the third one is the triquetrum. So these three carpal bones, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, come together the radius, okay, that allows then at the radiocarpal joint movement, like I'm going to flex my wrist or I'm going to snap my wrist, okay, as if I just shot a basketball. I can pull my wrist back, okay, we call this extension. So flexion, extension. In addition, at this joint, I can have movement such that I can, in this case, from an anatomical position, abduct my radiocarpal joint, or I can adduct. Abduct means going away from the uh, body. Adduct meaning coming back toward. So this is an example of a what we call condyloid joint, the radiocarpal joint. Now, we have another condyloid joint in our body that's very close okay, to the one I just mentioned, radiocarpal, and that would be here. All right, where at through these um, ends of the metacarpals, this little end of the metacarpal, where it joins this first phalanx of the um, finger, we would say, oh, that's the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Now, some of us might know as, hey, I'm going to give you a fist sandwich, and these three big knuckles, or four big knuckles here, would represent the metacarpal phalangeal joints. So, capable there of abduction and adduction. And then also capable, as you can probably imagine, of flexing and extending. So, movements at condyloid joints. So we have ball and socket, hinge, we have pivot, and we have condyloid. All right, then we also have, as an example, the saddle joint, again, in the hand. All right, the saddle joint example would be, here's my first metacarpal. The first metacarpal, of course, is in line with that thumb. The first metacarpal is going to meet up with one of these uh, bones that are called the carpal bones. The carpal bone that it meets up with would be the trapezium. So where this carpal bone and this metacarpal bone link up, that is an example of a saddle joint. Now, actually, you know, I usually analyze in my kinesiology examples with the personal training or anatomy and physiology that I teach, okay, or kinesiology that I teach. I don't talk a lot about and analyze a lot of what's going on in the thumb. Not that it's not important, but hey, here's an example of a saddle joint. All right, finally we have the planar joints, planar. Not very much movement at planar joints. If you consider, okay, all these little bones that make up the carpal bones or the wrist bones, there are eight of them. And in between those bones, although we're not even aware of it, there will be some slight movement. So the intercarpals, okay, would be examples of planar joints or sometimes referred to as gliding joints. Same thing holds true down here for looking at the um, Tarsals. The tarsals are similar. They're the ankle bones, sort of like the carpals are the wrist bones. The tarsals, again, movement, just like movement between them, they're referred to as another category of synovial joints. Um, so we say the intertarsal and intercarpal joints are examples of planar or gliding joints. So those are the six categories of um, synovial joints. Again, that's the structural classification, and we refer to all these synovial joints being freely movable or being what we refer to as diarthroses.